These are the notes on waves. Now we're going to get into the kinds of waves you were expecting, like maybe ocean waves and things like that. But there might be some other things that might not have occurred to you are also waves. So what is a wave? A wave is a disturbance that carries energy through either matter or empty space. So Newton's laws apply here and they govern the motion of waves for the most part, if we don't get into relativistic effects. And there's many, many kinds of waves. All of them have something in common. They transmit energy and there's some that you cannot even see. So there's water waves on the ocean, sound waves that you're hearing right now, okay? Waves that'll travel down a rope or a spring, a those are vibrational waves, mechanical waves. So mechanical waves are waves that involve matter. And those are the ones that we can sort of get a handle on, that we can directly interact with. So mechanical waves require a medium, such as water, air, ropes, a spring, okay? They can travel through solids as well, as you will see. So there's other waves, mostly we're talking about electromagnetic waves, we'll get to a little later, that are a little harder to keep track of. Only some of them can we actually see. That's actually a very small fraction of the electromagnetic waves. So they're a little harder to deal with. So to a large extent, we like to understand waves based on the ones we can easily deal with, the mechanical waves. Those are our models. And waves all have certain things in common. So if we can understand the mechanical waves, then we can sort of translate that to the sort of more elusive waves, okay? Like electromagnetic radiation. There are fundamentally two different kinds of mechanical waves. One of them is the transverse wave. That's probably the kind of wave you're thinking about. On the ocean, that's a transverse wave, okay? Um, if you something goes up and down, it's a transverse wave. If you have a rope that's held tight and you flick it upward and back down, it'll send a little pulse along. You can see that travel pretty easily. That is a transverse wave. So waves obtained in strings and ropes are transverse waves. That's one of the ways we model them. Then there are longitudinal waves. Longitudinal waves are a little bit harder to observe because they involve the compression of the medium and the expansion of the medium but you can hear longitudinal waves. Sound is a longitudinal wave. It's a compression of the medium. You're hearing a pressure pulse traveling from the speaker of your device to your ear, okay? So in a longitudinal wave, the direction of the particle displacement is in the same direction as the wave is moving. But in a transverse wave, the first one, it was perpendicular side to side. So in a longitudinal wave, there is no side to side motion. And so it's a little bit harder to observe. You have to look a little more closely. One way to make a longitudinal wave is to take a slinky, not one of the tangled ones, but a brand new one. They only seem to last a few days in my experience with my kids anyway. Take the slinky, stretch it out straight. And then on with while it's held tightly with one hand, move forward and back suddenly. That'll send a little pulse that travels along the length of the slinky. You can also do this with some kinds of springs as well. And that's an example of a longitudinal wave. A longitudinal wave needs to travel through something and it can travel through solids, it can travel through liquids, and it can travel through gas, as you can hear. Transverse waves, however, have trouble traveling through certain mediums, media, excuse me. So we'll talk about that as we go. And of course, mechanical waves are the ones that we try to use as a model because with both of these, we can sort of see them happening. We can sort of observe it directly. It's a little bit harder. You need special instruments to observe some of the other kinds of waves. So here we see a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave. Notice how with a longitudinal wave, what we see is the spacing between the lines is all that is changing. And so the lines are being compressed and that sort of pulse of compression 
is traveling along. And then behind it, after it travels, then the material returns to the normal spacing. Whereas at the bottom with the transverse wave, we can really easily see the side to side motion. Okay, there's much more side to side motion going along. That is not the direction the wave is traveling. Notice the wave is traveling in both cases to the right. But with the transverse wave, the displacement is up and then down, up and then down. Interesting, right? So those are fundamentally the two kinds of mechanical waves. So again, longitudinal waves involve a displacement of the particles in the same direction that the wave is moving. Think of it as a pulse of compression traveling in the same direction. Well, because of this, it turns out longitudinal waves can travel very fast, very quickly. Okay, they're not wasting time with the side to side stuff. On the other hand, transverse waves can only occur in a medium that will snap back into place. There are some media that do not do that. For example, if you try to travel through a liquid with a transverse wave, unless you're on the surface, okay, it will not travel through the body of liquid because liquids don't snap back into place. Okay, except on the surface where there's a boundary between the liquid and the air. So transverse waves are a little bit slower because they involve side to side motion that kind of slows it down. It doesn't travel, the compression is not in the same direction that the wave is moving. Interesting, right? So a great example of mechanical waves are actually seismic waves, waves generated by an earthquake. Now, you might not realize that an earthquake generates more than one kind of wave. The main kinds of waves they produce are P waves and S waves. So P waves are longitudinal waves, and then S waves are transverse waves. So that determines what they can travel through. It turns out a P wave can travel through pretty much anything, anything that's there, any solid, liquid, even gas, Kind of like sound is a p wave okay so if there's an earthquake you can receive the p waves from that earthquake if you have a sensitive enough instrument on the opposite side of the planet notice how the black lines travel right through the planet they bend a bit but then they come out on the other side however the s waves which are the transverse waves okay they don't travel through the entire planet they only reach about half the planet, a little bit more than half. Notice there's a shadow at the bottom. They call that the S wave shadow. Those are all the places on Earth that the S waves do not reach. So why don't they reach there? Well, for an S wave, it involves side to side motion or up and down motion. And so in order for it to propagate, for it to travel through a substance, the substance has to snap back in place. It has to be elastic, okay? But it turns out liquids are not elastic. If you shove a little bit of liquid in one direction, it sort of disperses and spreads out and it doesn't bounce back to where it was. So this shows us that part of the planet Earth must be a liquid. The part of the planet that is a liquid is what we call the outer core, the area that's sort of orange on this diagram where the S waves all stop. Now you might say that's funny because side to side waves well, that's what we're used to thinking about in the ocean, like up and down, side to side, okay? Um, that's the kind of, the transverse waves, those are the kinds we're used to seeing in the ocean. Well, not quite. The waves you see on the ocean are right on the surface. Those are called surface waves, and we'll get to that in a moment. And earthquakes also produce surface waves, but the surface waves die out rapidly. They don't make it very far from the source of most earthquakes. But the P waves and the S waves have the potential to travel around the planet. However, only the P waves make it to the other side because the S waves die out in the liquid outer core. And we'll talk about this more later, assuming that we have time. I'm planning to get into this a little bit more later, but that's about all for now, about seismic waves. So what about ocean waves? Let's say when there's still a swell before they break on the coastline, what are they? Are they longitudinal or are they transverse? Well, pretty much you could say they're mostly 
transverse because most of what you think about is the sort of up and down motion. But actually, they're a little bit of longitudinal because the particles in the wave actually do move a little bit in the direction of the motion, forward and back. What they wind up doing is making a little circle, okay? And the energy is propagated. Now, surface waves only occur when you have a contact between two different materials that are of different densities. At those boundaries, that is the only place you can get surface waves. So it turns out in the rest of the body of the ocean, transverse waves will not propagate. Under the water, they won't propagate. Only right at that boundary on the surface between the water and the atmosphere above, that is where they are capable of propagating. And there's a whole bunch of things going on there, but basically the energy can be transferred for thousands and thousands of kilometers over great distances. And most of that energy transfer, you could say is more of the transverse type. And yet there is a very small amount of longitudinal motion in every wave, a little bit of forward and back motion. So they're not exactly one or the other. It's a little bit of a hybridization going on here. Okay, so surface waves, even though I told you there's basically two types, surface waves have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So what do we measure when we're measuring waves? Well, one thing that's easy to measure, the easiest thing is the wavelength. That is the distance between one wave and the next wave. So where do you measure it? From the bottom or the top or the middle? It doesn't really matter as long as it's the same point corresponding point on the next wave. A lot of times people choose the crest, which is the very top of the wave, especially with ocean waves, because it's easy to see one wave and then the one after it, and to measure that distance, that is called the wavelength. And we measure that with all kinds of waves. Every wave has a wavelength. With ocean waves, we like to measure the wave height, which is how much the wave goes up compared to when it's at its lowest point, well, it turns out that wave height is doubled what we call the amplitude. That's not what we, the way we normally measure most waves. But it turns out when you're at the beach looking at a wave, the thing that's important to you is how much higher the wave is than the low point in front of it. So we, that's the way we measure ocean waves. Notice here that the water in the waves is going in a little bit of a circle. So it is sort of up and down mostly, but a little bit forward and back as well as it goes around that circle. And that that disturbs the water below it, making it go in a smaller circle. And the water below that, making it go in a smaller circle until eventually the energy dissipates. So it turns out if you are deep enough in the ocean, you would have no concept that a wave is passing above you. If you are greater than one half of a wavelength below the surface of the water. Isn't it interesting that that depth is not related to the wave height? So this goes for waves with the same wavelength with very different heights. But what matters is how deep you are compared to the wavelength. One half of a wavelength, and that's a pretty good rule of thumb. That's as far as the water is being disturbed pretty much at all. So let's say a fish in the water above that line will move in a small circle as the wave goes by. If it's further up closer to the surface, it might get moved in a bigger circle, okay? But if it's below that line, unless the fish was looking upward, wouldn't even know a wave went by. So surface waves really are near the surface, on the surface, near the surface. And that kind of energy doesn't propagate very well through a body of water. As you can see how those circles are dying down, they're getting smaller and then disappearing, okay? So some kinds of energy don't travel well through fluids like liquids or gas. And one of those is transverse waves. They just don't generally travel through liquids or solids. They dissipate very rapidly. They can travel a very short distance through liquids or solids. So longitudinal waves pretty much travel through any material. They just need something to travel through. But transverse waves will only travel through solids. However, the surface wave is a little bit of both. So if you want to see a longitudinal wave, by the way, you're hearing them right now. Sound is a longitudinal wave. But if you want to see one with your eyes, well, if you happen to have a slinky, 
or a loosely coiled spring, try to avoid using one of those tightly coiled springs because they can snap back and do some damage. But if you have like one of those looser springs, one that was designed to be a child's toy, they're usually pretty safe. And if you attach each end to something that won't budge, something that won't move, something massive, and then if you pinch a portion of the coil of the spring, well, you bring some of the coils closer together. That's a little bit of compression. When you release that, suddenly you will see that that compression travels along the slinky in both directions. That's a great example of a longitudinal wave. Notice how the compression travels in this, uh, the uh, springs are compressed in the same direction that the wave travels. So that is an example of a longitudinal wave. Okay, this kind of wave can actually travel right through, obviously air, because you're hearing this, which is a fluid, even water, that's how you can sort of hear underwater, it sounds very different, but sound travels underwater as well. And of course it can travel through solids, solids like a slinky, but also solids like a table. So longitudinal waves can travel through any medium as long as there is a medium to travel through. What they can't travel through is emptiness, a vacuum, uh, a void, empty space. That is when they die out. So that is why sound doesn't travel through space. Despite what you hear in Star Wars, you wouldn't really hear those blasts. Where are you hearing them from anyway? They don't make that clear in the movies. Okay, so what can we measure about a wave? There's actually several properties we can measure about most waves, or almost all waves. We can measure the speed of the wave, that's kind of obvious, how fast it's going. We can measure the amplitude, that is how far it displaces from the equilibrium position. So it might go up and down, but we only measure the amplitude in one of those two directions. Usually it's symmetrical, so if you just measure one of them, okay, then the displacement in each direction is equal but opposite, okay? We're talking about transverse waves. Then there is the wavelength, and it's especially easy to measure wavelength with transverse waves from one peak to the next. Or you can measure from one trough, which is the low point of a wave, to the next trough. Or you can actually measure from any two similar points on subsequent waves. Then there is the phase. The phase indicates whether waves are lining up or not. Okay, it's sort of like where is the wave starting in your wherever you're defining zero. Then there is the period of the wave, okay? The period of the wave is how long it takes the wave to pass by you, and the frequency is how many waves pass by you each second, okay? So all of these things can be measured about most waves. The interesting thing is that for most mechanical waves, whether it's transverse or longitudinal, the speed of the wave really just depends on the medium that it is traveling through. That is why there's a speed of sound. Well, that's just not the absolute speed of sound. That's the speed of sound in air. And actually, the speed of sound varies a bit depending on the temperature of the air and a bunch of other factors. But it's essentially the same. Doesn't matter how quickly you're talking or how slowly you're talking, you're basically going to get the sound traveling at the same speed. Isn't that interesting that it depends on the medium and the density of the medium for how fast the wave travels? The same thing goes with sound through water. The same thing goes with sound through wood or granite. It really depends on the density of the medium, okay? So here we see a snapshot of two transverse waves, sort of frozen in time. This is what they look like at one moment. Wave A on the top, wave B on the bottom. Notice that a wave has a crest. That is the top of the wave, like the mountain part of the wave. And a wave has a trough. A trough is the bottom, that's how you pronounce it. That's the bottom of the wave, that's the basin. Like an animal, a feeding trough is where an animal, like a goat would eat out of, or a horse. Think of those kinds of things. Or like a sink shape, like a trough, okay? Now, the things you can measure about a wave are the wavelength, and typically we measure the wavelength from one crest to the next crest because that's the most obvious thing. If you're looking down from above, okay, it usually stands out with transverse waves. 
but you could just as equally measure the wavelength from one trough to the next trough, as long as it's from the corresponding part of the, of the next wave, of the subsequent wave. So look at the bottom in wave B. See that little symbol way at the bottom? That's a lambda. That's a lowercase lambda, the Greek L. And that's what we use to represent wavelength. Notice it is actually measuring here from one trough to the next trough. That would be the same measurement, by the way, if you measured from one crest to the next crest. Okay. And the other thing that was shown here is the amplitude of the wave. The amplitude is how much displacement there is from the equilibrium. Notice how the amplitude is just measured in one direction, okay? And it should be many waves, most waves are symmetrical. So if it moves this much up, it would also move the same amount down. So the total amount of displacement of the wave is twice the amplitude. If you're going from the very top of the crest to the bottom of the trough, that's what they measure with ocean waves. That is what they call wave height. But generally we don't measure wave height, we measure the amplitude, okay? So notice the amplitude of wave A is about twice the amplitude of wave B. So it's a much taller wave, let's say. It goes up more and it goes down more, right? It's got a bigger range there. But the wavelengths are the same. Notice that the troughs line up and the crests line up, okay? That shows you that the two waves are actually the same wavelength, okay? Also, they're in phase with each other. That's another that's another thing that's going on here. They're starting at the same part of the wave when, when our time begins here, or where the graph begins on the left, let's say, okay? So wave A and wave B have the same wavelength, but different amplitudes, and now you can sort of see how we measure waves. And these are great examples of transverse waves. So one thing you can measure about a wave is obviously its frequency. So what is the frequency of a wave? The frequency of a wave is the number of complete oscillations or waves that it makes each second. So if you pick a particular spot and count how many waves pass by that particular spot, that is the frequency, okay? But the way that we calculate frequency is often using the period or T, remember capital T is period. The frequency of a wave is equal to 1 over t, which is the reciprocal of the period, 1 over t. So because it's 1 over t and t is in seconds, then the units of frequency wind up being 1 over seconds. That's the unit, which is a strange unit. People don't like that unit. Just having 1 over seconds seems weird. It's not like having meters over seconds, meters per second. That sounds normal, but 1 over second? So what they came up with was a unit that means one over seconds, one per second, and that is called the Hertz, just like the rental car. So a Hertz means the same thing as one over a second, one per second. And you can calculate it using the time period. That is one of the ways it is normally calculated. And it's interesting that both the period and the frequency depend only on the source, the oscillator. It doesn't really depend on the speed the wave is traveling. It depends on how quickly the oscillation is occurring. Interesting, interesting. So maybe this will help you remember the unit for frequency, okay? Hertz rental cars. Well, there's a lot of those offices around the world at airports and wherever. So if you add up all the Hertz rental car agencies in the world, uh, it doesn't usually go this fast for me, but Maybe they're renting one car per second. I guess it's possible, I don't know. So the unit of Hertz is equal to one per second. Pretty fast rental, right? So the reason for this is because of the definition of frequency, one over T, which is the reciprocal of the period. Remember T stands for the period of the wave. The other main thing that we usually directly measure about a wave is its wavelength. Wavelength can often be directly measured because you can see it, okay? Very frequently you can see it. So the main equation we use for wavelength, remember that purple symbol there is the lowercase lambda, the Greek letter L, that's what we use for wavelength, is equal to velocity 
divided by frequency. That is the one we most often use. But remember the definition of frequency is equal to one over T. Hmm. So there's another equation for wavelength and you can see it just above, it's written very small, lambda equals velocity times period, VT. Interesting. So those are both valid ways of calculating the wavelength if you don't know the wavelength, or if you do know the wavelength, that is a valid way of determining either the vol velocity or the frequency, or with the little one above, determining the period. Interesting. So again, the wavelength can be measured from corresponding parts of the subsequent wave. So from crest to crest or from trough to trough, either way works fine. So these are the two primary equations we are gonna be using for waves. There's also many variations on them. And there's also different symbols that we sometimes use for frequency, like the Greek letter nu is often used but that can be confusing. If you have a V and a nu, they look kind of similar. So I'm just gonna use F here, okay? And then don't forget that T is period. And you just gotta know how to manipulate these equations algebraically and think about the units. And don't forget what a Hertz really is, one per second. So we'll be doing a bunch of calculations with these. All right, so let's look at a snapshot of a wave here. And let's see if you can determine what the wavelength and the amplitude of this wave is. Now notice that the scale is in meters, right? So the scale is a little different vertically than it is horizontally. They do that quite a bit depending on the type of wave. So first of all, what is the wavelength of this wave? Depending on where you pick to start, let's start at four meters. At 4.0 meters, notice there's a nice crest right there, okay? Well, where's the next crest? The next crest is at eight meters, 8.0 meters. So then what would the wavelength be? What is eight minus four? Of course, it's 4.0 meters. So the wavelength or the lambda here is 4.0 meters. What is the amplitude represented by this wave? Notice the baseline is set at zero and the greatest that it reaches, as you can see at the very, very left is 0 0.2. Also notice, that the greatest depth it reaches in the trough is negative 0.2. It's equal but opposite displacement in both directions. So what is the amplitude? 0.2 meters. It's the absolute value of the displacement, right? And you could say this, you could also measure the trough and just take the absolute value of that. It's how much it is offset from the equilibrium position, which is zero on the y-axis. So that's how you measure the wavelength, and that's how you measure the amplitude, which are two very important things to know about a wave. Okay, so we're gonna do a bunch of quick examples here. First of all, what is the frequency of a wave with a period of 4.0 seconds? So where is the period here? Which of these letters, which of these variables is the period? Oh yeah, it's the T. So this is the period, the time period, okay? If that helps you remember it. What is the frequency? Well, here's frequency in both of these. But remember, you need two out of three in either one of these. You need two of the three things to solve for it. And uh, so here we've got one and T we can solve for F. So let's use the yellow one. So we're solving for F. This one's no good. Solve for F, okay? And that is equal to 1 over 4.0 seconds. So now we've got to isolate our variable, right? Oh, wait, our variable is isolated. Isn't that nice? Whenever your variable come, starts off isolated, that makes things a lot easier for you, doesn't it? Makes it a lot easier to start with. So now we just have to divide this side. So it's the reciprocal of 4.0, I don't have a one over x function, so I just do one divided by 4.0 equals, and what do I get? I get 0 0.0.25, and then what unit would it be? Well, I divided one by seconds, so I could put one over seconds. 
But that looks weird. One over seconds. Isn't there another unit that that is equal to? Oh yeah, what's that rental car company? Oh yeah, that's a Hertz. So I knew I had to rewrite it anyway in scientific notation. So let me do that and let me put the correct unit on it now. Okay, frequency is equal to 2.5 times 10. So how many places did I have to move the decimal here? I had to move it one, so is it 10 to the first? Oh no, wait, I had to move it that way, right? I had to move it the wrong way, let's say. So it's negative one. So remember, if your number, if your number is less than one, then you'll get a negative exponent in scientific notation. And then I could put one over s, technically that is correct, but there's another unit, hertz. And that's the way we like to write it. So there's the answer to this one. So next one, what is the period of a wave with a frequency of 12 hertz. There's that hertz again. So again, we have a frequency. So there's two frequencies on here and we're solving for a period. Oh yeah, that's T. Oh, so we're using that one again. Okay, so this time we're putting in the frequency and that is 12 hertz. Remember that's one over seconds and that is equal to one over and we're solving for T. Oh boy. This is something messy. When you're solving for an unknown variable, right, and it's in a de denominator, oh, that gets messy. You have to usually use a couple of steps. Get it on the other side, then move this around. Oh, no, you don't. There's a fast way to do this. So it is true. You could multiply both sides by t, get t on the other side. Then you have to isolate it. Divide both sides by 12 hertz, get 12 hertz on this side. You could do that. But what I like to do, what I love to do in this situation, is I love to cross multiply. So how can I cross multiply if this is a fraction, but this isn't? Hmm. Now you probably remember cross multiplication. I'm assuming you do, but let's just remind you, you need, you need two fractions separated by an equal sign. So what is the denominator over here? If there's no denominator, well, then it's one. Remember, if there's no visible denominator, you can always throw a one under it. It means the same exact thing. Now, what do I do? I multiply the two numbers that are diagonal. In this case, they're both ones. And then I divide by the remaining number, and then I divide by this, and that's what you do in cross multiplication. Cross multiplication is actually multiplication followed by division. The great thing about it, the reason I like it, is because you don't have to move things around. You don't have to go through all those little steps. It's really quick. It gets you right to the answer. And then what we're solving for is t. So it's going to be t is going to be equal to, well, cross multiply here, it's 1. And then it's going to be divided by, divided by the odd number out, which turns out to be, it's an even number, but 12 hertz. Isn't that weird? Okay, so it's really 1 divided by 12. Well, that's going to be a small number. One, I could put 1 over 12, but I'm putting 1 divided by 12. That's a divided by sign. Okay. So 1 divided by 12 equals, oh, that's a very small number. So the time period, the period is equal to, well, let me put it in red, 0 0.0, I don't know if you can see this, 8, and then it has repeating threes going on and on and on. Repeating threes ad infinitum, right? But we don't need to keep all of those, but we're going to put this in scientific notation. So knowing that, I'm going to keep a couple more of those. So even though this is tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths place, I'm still going to keep it. Okay. So now this is the weird thing. What happens when you divide by hertz? Well, remember, hertz is one over seconds. So when you divide by it, it flips it over. And so the unit here is seconds. That's the reason that this can get a little confusing. But just realize if you're solving for t, it is going to come out in seconds. And then, of course, we have to throw that into proper scientific notation. And that would equal 8.33 times 10 to the, well, how many places did I have to move the decimal? Bing, bing, 2. But again, it's the wrong way, negative 2. So remember, that doesn't make the number negative. It just means it's less than one. And don't forget that unit. This whole thing would be wrong without the correct unit. 
and I think I'll circle it in a different color that we haven't used, or we haven't used this color. Okay, so there is my beautiful answer. So is that, is that a very long time period? No, of course not. That's a very short time period because, because it means that 12 are going by in one second. So think about it. If 12 of them are going by you in one second, of course the time period is going to be less than a tenth, of, less than a tenth of a second, let's say. Okay, right? If it was 10 hertz, right? Then it would mean 10 of them are going by each second, then it would be 0 0.1, wouldn't it? It would be one times 10 to the minus one. So there's another example. Next example, what is the frequency of a wave with a wavelength of 99 meters? Oh, that's a long one. And a velocity of 25 meters per second. So what was the symbol here for wavelength? Well, we know what frequency is, that's F. By the way, sometimes they use the Greek letter nu for frequency like this, but that looks a little too much like a V and it gets confusing. So I'm like to use F. Let's not worry about that one. So what, which one here is the wavelength? Oh yeah, length is L. So it's the Greek L, it's this lambda. Now the way that I draw my lambdas is actually like this. This is the way I was taught to draw them. And this is the way that this particular font comes across. So they always look something like this. A capital lambda, on the other hand, looks like a triangle that you folded the bottom out to the sides, like a flattened out pyramid, so like almost like a pyramid. Okay. So this is the lowercase lambda, that's the wavelength. So we gotta use this one. Do we have everything we need here? Well, that means we need one of these. Oh yeah, we've got velocity. So we've got bing, or is it the speed? Sometimes we just call it the wave's speed, right? But of course, velocity is a vector, speed is a scalar, but it's the same idea. It's how fast it's going, okay? So if we know the wavelength, uh, no we don't. So if we know the wavelength of 99 meters, that goes right here, 99 meters. It doesn't have a point zero, so I'm not gonna put that. And it equals, and then we've got a fraction over here, velocity, 25 meters per second on top, and we're solving for F. So after the last example, you know what I'm gonna do here. What am I gonna do here? Again, we're solving for an unknown variable in a denominator, what's the best option? The best option is cross multiplication. So in this case, both numbers are not one. I'm multiplying these diagonal numbers, the 25 meters per second times one. But of course, anything times one remains itself. So now we've got, let's see over here, we're solving for frequency is gonna wind up equaling, it'll be 25 meters per second, 25 meters per second, and let me write it neater this time, a divided by sign, that's a divided by sign, divided by the leftover number, the number that is sort of left out of all of that, this number here. So remember, in cross multiplication, you take whichever two numbers you have that are diagonal and multiply them, and then you divide by the remaining number to solve for the unknown, no matter where they are. That's what's so great about it. So we're dividing this by 99 meters. So notice 25 divided by 99, well, if it was divided by 100, it would be like one quarter, right? One fourth point, but it's divided by 99. It's gonna be very close to a quarter, obviously, okay? So let's do, let's solve for it down here. Frequency equals, let's do 25 divided by 99 equals, and of course I get something very close to a quarter, but it's 0 0.252525, et cetera, okay? So let's put it as 0 0.25, and then 25 would round to, that would round to a three if I'm keeping just that digit, right? Because the five rounds up. And then what would my unit be here? Well, it's meters divided by meters, so the meters are gonna cancel. But nothing happens to the seconds. So it's still gonna be one over seconds. Again, nobody likes this unit. That looks weird, one over seconds as a unit. Nobody likes that. That's why they invented the rental car. Okay, so then, if we want to put that in scientific notation and fix the unit, we make it 2.53 times 10 to the, what is it going to be? Negative 1. What's the unit going to be? Better than this one? Hertz. What do we do with our answer? We circle it. Boom. 
Next example, what is the wavelength of a wave with a frequency of 100 hertz and a velocity of 340 meters per second? So which one do we want to use? Well, we've got, we want to solve for wavelength. Now we know what that is, which variable is that? Oh yeah, that's the wavelength. And we've got a frequency and we've got a velocity. So we've got everything we need here to solve for that. So we're using this one. So we're solving for wavelength, that's lambda right there. And what we've got here is a velocity, 340 meters per second. And we're dividing it by the frequency, which is 100 hertz. I bet you could do this one in your head, okay? So let me do a better lambda here. That's a nicer lambda, that's how it's supposed to look. 340 divided by 100 just moves the decimal over twice, doesn't it? So 3.40, so let's just leave it on the calculator. 3.40 divided by 100, pretty easy, 3.4. That's what shows on the calculator, but I'm gonna write 3.40. 3.40, what? What unit would it be? Well, meters per second divided by hertz. Remember, hertz is one over seconds. Now this is kind of confusing. If you think of hertz as one over seconds, and you're dividing by it, it's like, it's like multiplying this unit times seconds. Okay, so if it's multiplied times seconds, the seconds actually cancel, and all we're left with is the meters. Now that is confusing. That's one of the problems with Hertz, is it gets confusing about how to handle the unit, but come on, if you're solving for a length, what do you think it's gonna be in? It's gonna be in meters, isn't it, right? So then let's put that in proper scientific notation. This is a really quick one. Okay, 3.40 times 10 to the what? Well, we don't have to move it. We move it zero times. What is the unit? Meters, don't forget the unit. And circle your answer. Boom. So this one is, what is the velocity of a wave with a wavelength of 10 meters and a frequency of 77 hertz? So what do we have here? We've got, we want to solve for velocity. That's the only one that has velocity. Do we have the wavelength? Yes. And do we have the frequency? Oh yeah, so we have these two. We want to solve for this one. So again, it's this equation, okay? So let's solve, let's put the numbers in. The wavelength, which goes over here, 10 meters, that's that, equals, and we're solving for velocity. That's, what, that's the unknown variable. The frequency, is 77 hertz. You know what I'm about to do. I'm about to cross multiply. Over one, multiply the diagonals. 77 times 10, 770. 770 divided by one, 770. Interesting. So that's pretty easy. It's a pretty easy one. So velocity equals, I could just write, I'll just write it. So it's 77 times 10, obviously, 77 times 10, 770, and I'm gonna write 770, and now what would the units be there, okay? Well, we're multiplying them, and this is meters, and this is per seconds, so multiplying them together, guess what you get? Meters per second, isn't that what you'd like to get for velocity, isn't that what you should get? And then don't forget, you have to divide, even though it's a one, just think about it, you gotta divide by that remaining number, so it's that divided by one. And that one has no unit, doesn't change anything. So that is gonna be the answer. So I'm just gonna jump straight to putting it into scientific notation. Equals 7.70 times 10 to the, what would it be? How many places did I have to move the decimal? Boom, boom, I had to move it twice. And then it's still the same unit, meters per second. Because when you divide by one, I mean, I could do the divided by one part if you want me to. Divided by one, same thing. Anything divided by one is the same. Anything times one is the same. That's the great thing about the number one, isn't it? Okay, and then if I, if that's my answer, circle my beautiful answer. Okay, last example. What is the wavelength of a wave with a period of 2.2 seconds and a velocity of 15 meters per second? Okay, so what do we got here? We're solving for wavelength, which is that. Do we have both of these? Well, we do have velocity, but we don't have frequency. Oh no, guess what? We have to use 
both in this case. I wanted to use at least one example, and this is it, where we have to use both equations to solve our problem. So it turns out we actually have to start with which one? We need to get our f, so we have to start with this one. Okay? So we're solving for f, and that is equal to 1 over, and what's the period? What's the t? 2.2 seconds. Okay, so then we can just divide that, and we get f equals, so it's the reciprocal of 2.2, 1 divided by 2.2, and it equals 0 0.0.4545 0 .4545 forever, so we do 4, 5, and I'm going to keep the next digit, which would have been a 4, but the 5 rounds it up, so 4, 5, 5. Okay, that's what I'm keeping. And then the frequency, we 1 divided by seconds, it's going to give us actually hertz, but you know what? Because that's not going to be our final answer, I'm going to keep it in this case as 1 over seconds, just for my calculations. I'm just going to keep it like that, that weird unit. So now that we've got frequency, we can jump to this equation, and we're solving for wavelength, that beautiful lambda, that's a good one, equals, and we've got the velocity, where's the velocity? Oh, there it is. We put that on the top. That equals... 50 meters per second, and then this we just solve for, the frequency goes down on the bottom, right? And so that's 0 0.455, 1 over seconds, so you can sort of see what happens here. And that means if we divide those, we're going to get lambda. We don't really have to cross multiply, because both the numbers are on the same side, and our variable is already isolated. So this one isn't too bad. I could have made it worse than this. Oh well, maybe I should have. So what is 50 divided by that? Well, that's going to go in a lot of times. If that was 0.5, it would probably go in like 100 times. So it's going to be like more than that. It's going to be like a number bigger than like 100. It's going to be a big number. So 50 divided by 0 0.455 equals, yes, it's over 100. It is 109.89. Okay, and what would the units be? Well, look, this is easier to see because we're dividing meters per second by one over seconds. So isn't it obvious there if you're dividing this by that that the sec per seconds will cancel? And all you'll be left with is, of course, the meters, which is exactly what you want in a wavelength. Now let's put this in scientific notation. So your wavelength, you've got to get used to doing a lambda like that, is equal to one point. And now, if we round it to these two digits, so what happens? Well, the 8 rounds up the 9. The 9 rounds up the 0. So we get 1, 0. Notice how I rounded that, right? You could say the 9 rounds up the 8. The 8 rounds up the 9. The 9 rounds up. So it keeps rounding until you get a 1 in that place instead of the 0, right? And if I kept another digit, it would be a little... It would, it would actually still round to that. It would just have another zero. And then times 10 to the, what's the power? You should know by now. Come on, you know. It is, boom, boom. You have to move it twice. So it's 10 to the second. Is that my answer? No, almost. Because we need the unit. And remember, if you're solving for a wavelength, even if this sort of stuff confuses you, a length is going to wind up in meters, isn't it? It's going to wind up in meters. So you better have a length unit for wavelength, right? And then I circle my beautiful, beautiful final answer of all these examples. I tried to do those really fast, and I think I succeeded. So hopefully you can see all the different permutations of these equations. And there's a few other things we could do with it. I guess I could have made this one a little more challenging, but there we go. So that is the end of the notes on waves.